Uh, all right. Glad we've, we've got our technical issues worked out and we're ready to go. Um, so welcome to session four of the uh, certificate program in practice-based research methods. Um, today our topic is participatory research in PBRNs and patient-centered outcomes research. And um, as with our previous webinars, we have really preeminent experts in the field who are going to be with us today to present and share their knowledge and experience with us. I would like to introduce them. Um, we have Dr. Lindy Knox, uh, who is the founding director of LANET, a primary care practice-based research network and resource network that supports improved health outcomes for low-income families in Southern California. Uh, LANET provides trained staff to safety net practices that support clinician-led research, community empowerment, and translation of new treatments and health service models in safety net practices. Dr. Knox and LANET are currently engaged in the implementation of a national primary care extension program, which is a national network of quality improvement facilitators who support transformation and enhance quality of primary care services across the U.S. She's developed great training resources that are used nationally by PBRNs and practices and health systems on practice facilitation and youth violence prevention. Very glad that she can be with us today. I also want to introduce Dr. Don Neese, uh, who is at the University of Colorado Denver, where he serves as the Green Edelman Chair for Practice-Based Research and as Director of Community Engagement for the Colorado Clinical and Translational Science Institute, which is their CTSA. Uh, Don's work is dedicated to improving health from the level of individual doctor-patient interactions to community and population-based interventions. His research is largely conducted in communities and their primary care practices, most notably in the areas of chronic illness and systems change. Don is currently PI of the Cori funded project in which he conducts appreciative inquiry and boot camp translation projects with rural and underserved Colorado communities to select health priority topics and facilitate uh, successful health, health outcomes. So, um, Lindy and Don, I'll now turn it over to you. Um, I'll just say one more thing. Fellows, uh, if you have questions, please use the chat feature and uh, let us know that you have a question or raise your hand. Amanda, uh, Ross, and myself will jump in um, and, and uh, indicate if there's a, a question that's come up. Lindy and Don, you may see this in the chat uh, box as well, the chat window. And of course, feel free to address those questions as they come up. Okay? All right, turn it over to you two. All right, thanks, Jim. Um, thanks, great, Jim. Great to be with everybody today. Um, I'm going to uh, just take us to our, um, through our slides here and uh, get us going. So um, I'm going to take the first section of this uh, presentation. Lindy um, will uh, take a section in the middle, and then I'll finish up and uh, just encourage folks to, to break in and ask questions. And, I think we'll both try and pause a few places and just see if there's uh, any questions that folks folks might have as we're going along. So the objectives that we put together for today is to um, for you guys to begin to understand the role of participatory methods in PBRN research, um, to begin to gain a not working knowledge of key methods, and then Really where the rubber hits the road is think about how um, these methods might inform your own work if you're not already doing this kind of stuff. Um, if you are doing stuff, we'd love to hear um, examples of uh, how you found that helpful, what kind of challenges you've run into. Um, those would all be fair game for discussion. Lindy, anything to add? No, that sounds good, Don. All right, great. So um, why? Why in the world would you want to engage um, patients and community members? Uh, or as we like to call them uh, here in Colorado, free-range humans. Um, there's, there's, uh, first off, I think this, this issue that um, one of the problems that actually formed the basis of um, practice-based research was 
trying to get evidence from the pointy-headed academics uh, and academic medical centers um, into, into use. And are the questions that are being addressed really relevant? Well, really, those same kind of issues apply when you're talking about patients and community members. Getting them involved to help generate the questions, generate the ideas, and help in designing how you're going to uh, do that stuff um, really helps ensure that the work that you're doing is going to have direct application um, to the communities and the patients and the practices that you're working with. So that's, that's really the first, first thing to understand. Um, second piece is that uh, it keeps us honest as researchers. I think, um, you know, I still, I still see patients a bit, um, although not as, lo not as much as I did when I was starting out. Um, I like to think I have, you know, I have an idea of what uh, patients think, uh, but the conversations that we have with uh, patients and community members when we're doing this kind of work, very different from the kinds of conversations that we have, have in the exam room. And I'll just, just throw out one example um, that uh, perhaps uh, Matt Simpson, our fellow, will remember from, from one of our projects that he was involved with when he was a resident. Um, we were uh, bringing practices, and each practice brought a couple of patients um, to a meeting. And we were talking about self-management support. And um, we had practice providers, we had staff, and then their patients from different practices around our networks at the table. And um, the topic came up of the pieces of paper that people get handed at the beginning of a start of a visit when they're at the front desk. And, the staff person was like, well, we give you all these things to read. Are you saying that you don't read them? And the patient was like, yeah, that's right. We don't read them. <laughs> and, you know, by putting folks in a setting where, you know, it wasn't a patient care setting, you can have these kinds of honest conversations um, that keep us honest, keep, keep uh, our care providers honest. So that's really important. This trajectory change that is the next bullet here, I think, is, is also important. Um, and we'll, I'll illustrate that in a slide. Um, and finally, it's just more fun. Um, I think, hopefully, uh, as you folks have had varying levels of involvement with practice-based research, you've learned that one of the key um, fundamental cornerstones of this work is about relationships. And you, you get to meet just amazing people and um, get to really uh, enjoy working with them in partnership uh, to affect change. And that's, that's just fun. So let's, let's move on and dig in a little bit deeper. So this is a slide that I uh, borrowed from my good friend and colleague Jack Westfall, and uh, this apparently is the uh, Lyman uh, Colorado Fire Department. And this is a great example of what often happens uh, when we come out from the university. We've got the right tools, um, we've got, you know, a fire hose, we've got lots of water, we've got our protective gear. Um, but Without the help of the community, we might not be pointing that in the right direction. So this is just kind of a fun way of illustrating, um, again, the utility and the importance of involving patients and community members uh, using participatory methods. So this is, this is the piece about trajectory change. Um, so if you can imagine this slide being animated, um, and if we start over here on, let me see if I can put an arrow on the screen here. If we start over on the um, right-hand side here, where we're talking about analysis and publication in a journal, um, 
involving the community at that late, late stage uh, can be helpful. Um, it can help with uh, your dissemination of things back into the community. But you're only going to get a little bit of inflection of your trajectory. If you move back towards data collection, um, you're going to have um, more robust means of data collection. You're probably going to get more complete data. Um, working your way on back, involving the community, you know, after you've gotten the grant, they can help you um, tweak things so that you're going to be more effective with your project. But really, the farther you go back here, all the way to the idea stage, um, again, the more you're involving your community, patients, your stakeholder groups, um, the more you're going to be on a better trajectory in terms of where your work is going to end up and the ability to apply it directly to what folks are doing. Let me just take a pause there and see if anybody's got any questions or comments. Okay. I'll just, uh, I'll just yeah. Um, we have some uh, mentors on the on the call as well, and so I just want to welcome the mentors who have expertise in this area to feel free to add uh, some of your experiences as we go along too. Okay, right. go ahead. All right. So this next slide shows some basic principles, um, and these these come from Barbara Israel's work um, at the University of Michigan and. I think it would be useful for us to just kind of walk through these. Now, this, this is referring to community-based participatory research um, as an as a approach. And I think these really apply. So the first one of these, recognizing the community as a unit of identity. So understanding that um, people are rooted in place and in a particular location. That location has meaning. Um, one of the things that, that I like to do as an icebreaker when I'm meeting with community stakeholders is um, we all go around the table and give an example of something that we know about our community that somebody that's new might not know that is pretty significant. Um, and that, that's getting down to that notion of a community's identity. Second bullet here, building on the strengths and resources within the community. And th the first part of that is recognizing that every community has a reservoir of strength. They have resources. They have knowledge. They have expertise from living their lives as community members within that particular location. Um, our work needs to leverage that and build on that. The third bullet here facilitates collaborative, equitable involvement of all par partners in all phases of research. So the concrete example here, one of the things that, that we do in our boot camp translation work um, which I'll describe later on. When we're starting a boot camp translation project with community members, we spend a lot of time emphasizing that everybody at the table um, has equal things to contribute. Whether you're at the table as a researcher, whether you're at the table as a patient, whether you're at the table as a school teacher, at the table as a retiree, Everybody's got something to contribute. Next bullet, integrating knowledge and intervention for the mutual benefit of all partners. So this really also is kind of an equity issue, but um, there has to be benefit uh, for folks to, to come or and, and work with you. And it's important to check in with folks on a periodic basis and find out, Hey, is this working for you? You know, do we need to tweak this process? Um, what would make this more valuable? Um, but it can't just be about one one group or one-sided. Um, 
promotes co-learning and empowering process that attends to social inequities. Um, and I'm frequently reminded of my own blind spots as a as a aging white guy um, that grew up in a in a middle class home uh, of what my blind spots are to to social inequalities. And it's you know making um, not just having your ears open for that, but making it safe uh, in a group for people to talk about that is really important. Um, I really like this next one. Community-based participatory research is cyclical and iterative. Um, that sometimes can be frustrating if you're a pretty linear thinker. Um, and so uh, you have to realize that um, Things are cyclical. Um, you may re need to revisit things. And I, I see a question popping up here about uh, from Ann uh, about making it safe uh, for people to talk about social inequalities. Um, that's a great question. Uh, why don't I finish this list and then, then we can we can take that up and have a little discussion about that if that's okay. So um, next thing here, address its health from both positive and ecological perspectives. A um, good example of that is uh, work that um, we're doing right now using an, an appreciative inquiry process um, where we're really asking folks what's allowed them to be successful around certain um, health topics. We're, we've taken that on around mental health access. Um, we're right now finishing up interviews around um, Successful management of chronic pain. You know what's 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 working for folks. Um, again, gets back to that issue of strengths and resources. Findings and knowledge that are gained need to be disseminated to all partners. Um, and again, this is an area where having the community help you design how you're going to do that can be so helpful. How do we get the word out about what we've learned? Um, they're, they're going to be much smarter about that than, than we are. And then this last bullet is so, so important, which involves long-term commitment by all partners. So um, when you're first starting to work with a community group, um, they're going to be watching you very closely. And one of the things they're going to be asking themselves is, is this person really in in it for the long haul, or is this just about one project? Um, and so, you know, talking folks with folks about, you know, if this is if this works for all of us, this won't be just about one project. We're going to want to we're going to want to dig in and establish a long-term commitment and relationship here. And I do think circling back to Anne's question about safety. Safety to talk about things that are uncomfortable. Safety to talk about things that um, people might not ordinarily share about their community, about the lives that they're living. Um, that long-term commitment is one of those things that's going to make people feel safe. Um, I think that uh, whenever you're doing this kind of work, um, self-disclosing about What's going on in your own backyard uh, can also be a way to help people understand that you know um, there are these community issues um, that span lots of different kinds of communities. Uh, one of the things that we do with our groups as well in terms of uh, building trust and safety is we will spend um, way more time uh, in a first meeting just getting to know each other. Um, we'll spend about an hour and a half to two hours um, on that early phase before we actually start digging in and doing any um, what some might say work. Um, because we've found and we've learned that building that relationship, starting out by really getting to know folks, um, understanding 
where they're coming from, why they're there, what they hope to get out of participation is so, so important. Um, and at and it's real, yes. Yeah, I was going to. You have a comment? Yeah, yeah, that'd and, be great. Uh, one of the things that we do, this is Lindy, and I apologize, my voice. I'm just recovering from the flu, and now I did not get my shot. So go get the shot. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Um, so one of the things that we do to create kind of safety is one looking at having a, a member of the community actually lead the meeting or help co-lead the meeting which tends to change the dynamic a lot. Um, if the person in the kind of power hierarchy is the one leading the meeting, then it, and it oftentimes will kind of close things down. Um, but if we have a community member who is either co-leading or is comfortable and trained up to lead the meeting themselves, that works a lot better. And then we make sure that there are more community members in the meeting than um, the kind of the wonky types. And that also tends to help a lot. And then the third thing that we find makes a huge difference is when you shift power. Um, and power essentially means money. And so when the community has access to the money and control of some of the money and the agenda, um, that also creates safety. That's hard to do in a university setting. And I'll talk about that a little bit in my example. Um, but those, those are the things that we found make also a very big difference. Yeah, those are great, Lindy. Thanks for thanks for throwing those out. I would completely agree. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So, once again, it's all about relationships. Um, this is uh, folks from one of our community-based organizations that we work with here in um, Metro Denver, 2040 Partners for Health, and we were having a little celebration here as we were finishing up one of our projects. So um, if you didn't have a chance to already look at uh, one of the articles that we put out for you, this um, one from Jack Westfall and uh, colleagues about community practice-based research is community engagement. I think it's a really nice um, discussion of the common principles uh, between practice-based research and community-based participatory research. And this figure, I think, does a nice job of sort of illustrating um, how when you're doing PBRN work, there are multiple ways that uh, you work in, may work in community. Um, the solid lines here, you're, as you're Working through your PBRN, you're going to be working with a community of practices, um, and they have their own. They may have their own connections to, in this figure, either a rural community, a Latino community, or it may be a community that's defined by a particular um, health topic. Uh, for instance, a diabetic community, um, and then you also from the PBRN may have a direct interaction uh, through the dotted line uh, with those community members. Um, and I think it's uh, one thing I like about this and that it, it throws out that community um, can be conceived of in, in multiple different ways. It can be around a particular health topic. It can be geographical. It can be around um, ethnicity or a cultural identity. Um, these are all things that, that have meaning for folks and um, create the uh, nidus for community creation. And it's important to find out as you're starting to engage, you know, where those where those lines are, what the soft boundaries are, and um, one of the things that, that we constantly ask our communities is, do we have all the right people at the table? Depending on what we're working on, you know, do we need to reach out to, to somebody else? So this is a uh, example of um, a community-generated um, poster that came out of a 
project where um, the High Plains Research Network here in Colorado worked with their community advisory council on um, patient-centered medical home. And uh, they asked their um, group uh, after uh, they had engaged in some education uh, from uh, the academic side about what patient-centered medical home stuff was all about, how this was a movement within primary care, what those sorts of things, primary care practices were being asked to do, um, and then uh, put it out on the table for the community members. So what's all this stuff mean to you? What, is, what does this medical home stuff mean to you? And uh, you can see here all the great quotes that folks came up with, but really the fundamental central thing that they communicated back was that uh, a medical home is about a relationship, not a relationship between practice and their patients, which I think is a really cool way to think about that. It goes beyond the checklist that we sometimes get caught up in. So I'm going to uh, hand this next part over to Lindy. And Lindy, if you want, I can advance the slides for you. That'd be great, Don. Um, did we take a poll to see how many people are working on community-based story projects? Do we, do we know, Don? Or can people? No, can we you, haven't. Can you guys talk, or can you only like post things? Quiet. Uh, people can uh, they can raise their hands using the raise hand feature. I'm not exactly sure how this works, but we could try that. <laughs> <laughs> I just was wondering if people can can speak or can we hear them very easily or is that great? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Is is anybody that's on the call working on a CBPR project right now that they'd be willing to to share a little bit about? I see Kim's hand raised. Kim, can you talk a little bit about, share a little bit about what you're working on? I could. I was thinking maybe one of the uh, trainees might have a project, but if nobody else raises their hand, I'm certainly there for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it looks like you're it right now. So go oh, for wait. It. Oh, no, Deepak yep. just did. Hi. Hey, Deepak. Can you, Hi. Kim, can you just take a quick, quick minute and talk about just briefly your project, just like a little, little synopsis of it? Sure. So what we're doing is we're evaluating food security um, in pediatric clinics. Um, and we partner with a community organization called the Benefits Data Trust. What they do is they help families apply for different government benefits or services like SNAP, WIC. Um, they actually do Medicaid as well. Um, and so we sort of partner with them to try to, to try to do the screening for food insecurity with the clinicians in the practice. Um, but if you screen positive for food insecurity, then you can get referred to the community partner. Very cool. Yeah. We've got a, a similar, we've just been doing some surveying of the duals of the low-income seniors in food insecurity. I'd love to talk to you more. So talk a little yeah, bit about be great. how the community engagement piece of that. How did it, where's the community piece for you in this? Okay, so yeah, I mean, sharing. yeah, so that's why, I was, that's why I was a little bit hesitant to say because it's a little bit, um, I mean, the community engagement part was that, like, we did uh, engage sort of community members, well, we, we engaged family members, I should say. Uh, we engaged parents as children um, that were screened um, about what kind of things they would be interested in before we started the project. And then we're also doing um, interviews with families to try to understand, you know, was this process useful, like understanding how they feel about being screened for food insecurity in the clinics um, and what other resources they, they would like. So we get to get a separate group of parents that we met with to, like, talk about sort of the whole process um, and then also talk about, like, some of the um, some structured interview questions, like the interview guide and those kind of things. Great. Thanks. 
Kim, how about you? Well, sure. About um, 10 years ago, a community leader uh, who runs a um, neighborhood development association came because they heard that we wrote grants and said, hey, I need you to write me a grant, and we're trying to improve curbs and sidewalks in our community. And I said, wow, that's really insightful that you think of curbs and sidewalks as health. And they said, no, not really. We just need curbs and sidewalks. <laughs> um, so I said, well, I really don't know much about concrete and infrastructure, but I'm willing to give it a try. And let me explain to you why I do think curbs and sidewalks are health. And we started talking about the fact that this community has um, essentially shotgun bungalows uh, on lots that are 50 by 25. Kids have nowhere to play except to the community parks, and there's no way safely for parents to let their kids get there. So without a curb and a sidewalk, these kids weren't getting very much physical activity, and um, noted by a disproportionate level of obesity in the population and inactivity reports. So um, that began 10 years ago, and since then we've worked on helping fund um, about three or four research projects in collaboration, mostly with the community leading the topic and also being the um, primary grant recipient, with us providing the research support to engage the community across a spectrum of issues. A thing we're most proud of is having worked together for two years to collect um, food access needs in the community that was collected by community members for community purposes. And that information was turned around with some help into a business plan that leveraged about three and a half million dollars of venture capital to bring a full service supermarket to a community that's been a food desert for about the last 20 years. So one of the issues, the only thing I'd bring up is that um, many folks who do this will hear uh, that level of skepticism, Don, you pointed out, how important it is to have uh, the durable ongoing relationship. And I was accused very much at the very beginning of you're likely just going to be a weekend warrior. You know, you're going to come in and you're going to leave. And um, the real commitment from the research team needs to be that you know we showed up at the car wash. We showed up at the local fair. We were there for community events to show our solidarity and our collaboration with the community. And, and that went, it just had an enormous ripple impact on our ability to work collaboratively on health issues with them. That's great. So you are yeah. giving this talk, you and Deepak. That sounds like you guys need to connect <laughs> with each other kind of working in the same area with the food um, as the entry point. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's it. Well, let me, I'm going to move in and share a little bit of our experience. Um, and I picked one particular example. We've done many. Um, we've done, like Kim was talking about, some work on um, really open space. And um, one of my key community partners is a group called Latino Health Access. It's led by a woman named America Bracho. And they have a community health worker intervention model. And so we do, um, we basically work for them. And I think that was one of the big, um, Kim, I think you and Deepak kind of um, alluded to this. There's a, a paradigm shift that has to take place, I think, to do good community research and partnership is that you have to stop seeing yourself as um, kind of the experts from the outside and really start seeing yourself as a service provider. And so a lot of what my agency now, and we're no longer based in the university. We got so radical in our thinking about how to partner with communities that we found the university an uncomfortable home. And so we spun out, and we now are a 501c3 ourselves. And we basically provide research support to community organizations that approach us for, for help, just exactly like um, Kim, you just described. Um, so that's, that's one of the things, and I think um, one of the things to be aware of is just because community is in the label doesn't mean it actually is community. Um, and a lot of what now, and it, it certainly was not um, Israel or Minkler's intent, but a lot of what's called CBPR now is, um, is just in name only, because a lot of what makes community participatory research effective is the power. And when you get right down to the power has to do with money and who receives that money and who gets to call the shot. And so there's another um, term that started emerging a number of years ago, the community owned and managed research. And so a lot of the work that we're doing now is really in this latter bucket 
and again, the funding. We may help write the grant. We may um, design the, the research part of it. And I just I was just recently part of a project where we weren't brought in soon enough to do that, so it was a bit of a mess. Um, so our expertise is vital, but a lot of the agenda is actually being driven by the community. Um, the timing, another important lesson learned for us on, on these community projects is timing is, is very important and the community moves at a much more rapid timeline than anything um, in the research world and they get very rapidly frustrated and just decide you're worthless. Not because what you're doing isn't useful, but because it doesn't come out for two or three years later than when they needed the information. And so we found ways to start giving um, like we, we have a commitment to do every quarter progress reports to the community and provide, try to provide some useful information back to them in a timely manner. That's very hard to do and you really have to build it into your study design at the very beginning because we all know that some of these designs take a long time to, to come to fruition. I'm now doing a lot of work with health plans which is a new world for me and I'm actually finding them to be very similar to community partners in that they move extremely fast and they're very pragmatic and if that water's not pointed on the burning building, they look at you for five minutes and then they move on and they're done with you and that's it. Um, so I'm I'm now I feel like I'm in a bit of a boot camp myself. <laughs> 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 they're like I'm still sitting here at, at you know number two and they're at ten. Yeah, right. Uh, and so, and then the other thing for those of you that are in universities, it's, it's just if you're on the tenure track, just something to pay attention to is the community work is harder. Um, a harder road to hoe if you're trying to get tenure because it's slower. Um, the data are oftentimes softer and there's, it's typically less well funded. And so you want to think long and hard about that and you want to have a very good um, and probably powerful mentor, advisor that can help you navigate the tenure process at the university if you're going to build it on community yeah. research. Yeah, I'll just, so, just, if I could just jump in at that point. Um, there's a very interesting line in the new RFA for um, CTSAs that came out um, not too long ago, which uh, is asking in the um, community engagement section for folks to talk about how um, work in communities could be um, leveraged in promotion and tenure. It's so, good to see. Yeah. Kim or Deepak, do you guys have any reactions to what I just shared? Does any of that fit with your experience or do you have a different experience? No, that's very much my experience. That was very much my experience. I think it, it, it's, it's very fulfilling and it's like very exciting work to sort of work closely with community members and like families. Um, but I think it, there is sort of different uh, expectations, especially around timeline. That things just move much slower into sort of the academic world, and I think that can be a source of frustration for different outside partners. Kim, any reactions to it? Oh, it's it just you're preaching to the choir. I feel like we lead the same life, just on different in different environments, and you know, we do the exact same thing. I think one of the issues about community work and tenure um, that really challenges all of us and those on this call who are doing this is is to actually start thinking more creatively about models and ideas of what we can provide to review committees for tenure, particularly for our junior faculty, to demonstrate their scholarship and the impact of their work. Um, you know, for me it was a business plan and or testimonial letters from community organizations and groups and just having it be part of a promotion portfolio is something that, I mean, I think all of us in an academic setting can certainly help support. That's great. Um, so you could be a resource to the rest of the group if they're thinking about that. Um, all right, so next slide. Okay. So I'm going to talk about a process that we actually developed and it kind of blends, it crosses the boundaries between community participatory research. Um, it was not community owned and led. Um, and then also patient experience. And next slide. Okay. okay. So this was a project that we did with um, it's the Veterans Administration out here. 
and it was a quality improvement initiative, and there was an evaluation piece wrapped around it because we were looking for their, you know, their, they were doing PAC transformation, which is this, basically the same thing as PCMH. Um, and they were, um, the VA has always had a very strong commitment to having community members, their consumers, um, veterans, participate in their quality improvement initiatives and pretty much everything they do there. So it's very hardwired into that system. But as we worked with them for about two years, and we had a, a fairly small role in the project, what we saw, and it's very similar to the community councils that we see a lot of CPPR projects pull together, or you know sometimes even the FQHCs that have their community board members, um, but they really sat there. They were able to provide some input, kind of that initial level of engagement, is gathering that input. But the, the vehicle for them to become really robust partners with that quality improvement transformation team just simply didn't exist. They'd be brought up to the front. They'd be asked to give a couple of comments. It'd be a room of 80 people. These three vets would come up. They'd give comments. Everybody would nod and say, wow, that's great. And then they'd go right back to talking about what they were talking about. And so what we saw is a need to create a vehicle that made their input powerful and allowed, because it wasn't that the, the leaders of the group weren't wanting to partner with the vet, they just simply didn't know how. They did not have an easy way to engage them in a powerful way. And so we put together a process and used it with them, and it was, it's one of the most interesting things I've done in a really long time. If you can don't change the slide. You bet. Okay. Okay. So the, what we did, and we call it patient-partnered redesign. Um, you can call it consumer-partnered redesign, community-partnered redesign. Um, at the VA, they wanted the patient-partnered. And what we did in this process is we had a QI coach who met with this veteran partner, um, one of the vets who was a consumer of services at that VA, and asked them to share a recent encounter they had with the system, a recent healthcare visit. And then they walk through, just like you would do a workflow map of one of your processes in your clinic. We developed with them that coach would walk through step by step by step. You know, I'm getting an echo. Maybe someone needs to mute. Is anybody else hearing an echo? Yeah, just a little. So um, they walk through and they develop a map step by step by step. And it's very boring. I mean, it's okay, so you came into the clinic, and then where did you park? And then what did you do? And then when you walked in, who did you talk to? And what did they say? And then where did you go? And then what happened? And that's the QI coach's job, is to really make them get down to that level of granularity. And then once that QI coach and that patient have mapped that together, because there's no surprises, they know what happened in the experience, then they work together to do this in front of the caregiver or in front of the practice. Uh, hello. Are you just getting that at Do Dr. Knox? Just like anybody else. Uh, do you, are you on the phone, and do you have your computer on at the same time? Just make sure it's not you. Is, the, is, is there sound coming out with your computer speakers? No, there's no sound coming out of the computer. Okay, just no, sure. sometimes that's what happens. Like just computer. make sure that your computer is muted. Um, and, and 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 everyone else who's on the um phone line, please make sure to mute your phones, um, so that we don't get any feedback. All right. How do I mute my uh? If, my well, you, you would mute your um your computer, so you would you would go to your sound. We're just yeah. Okay. Okay. So my computer. And then you you would talk and listen through the phone, and uh, everyone else would just have to okay. mute their phones also. All right. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. So anyway, what what then happens is you get with the patient, and you guys go through that same process again. And in this case, we were in front of about 80. We had three vets, and we broke up into three small groups. There were about 80 or 90 care team members that were there. And we broke up into groups of 30, um, and each vet and their QI coach or their research assistant, whatever you want to call that person, went through this process in front of them. And then if you um, can go to the next slide, Don. Sure. All right. 
And so this is a little bit, and it just looks very much like a health test map. Um, and I'll tell you just a quick story about it, how powerful this was. So this was a veteran from Iraq, and he had been discharged from the military. He had been informed about the VA, but um, came home and did not access the VA services. Spent about three years struggling with PTSD, depression, all kinds of emotional problems, not getting any assistance. He became very, um, just very close to suicidal. And one day he was driving by and he saw the VA up on the hill and he thought, I'm going to go in and see what they can do for me. He drove into the parking lot. You can kind of follow the map a little bit when I'm telling this story. It's only part of the story. It's actually quite long. Um, he drives in, he parks his car, he, he has trouble finding parking, then he has trouble getting over into the building, finally gets into the building and goes to the receptionist who's so busy typing on the computer that he doesn't even look at him, um, sends him downstairs to get some paperwork processed if he didn't have his card that he needed, um, sits down there for 20 or 30 minutes, they process his card, um, there's some eye contact there but not a lot of human relations at all, or connection, relationship. He sent back upstairs to his team, his care team, which just happens to be the receptionist that he'd met who didn't have any eye contact with him. Same thing again, no eye contact. He's sent to the weight room, sit there 20 minutes. And you think about this is a patient who's three years PTSD, desperate, um, and already had just you know, basically the back of everybody's head experience when he's walked in. Then the social worker comes out, calls him across the room, turns around, starts walking down the hallway, doesn't even make eye contact because him always sees the back of her head. And he just, about halfway down the hallway, just explodes in tears, turns around and starts running out. He can't take it anymore. And a fortunate kind of happy accident happened that another social worker was walking out of her office, ran right into him physically by accident, saw that he was in distress, said, hey, will you come talk to me for a minute, looked him in the eyes, brought him into her office, sat down and talked with him, and rescued that visit, and then connected him to his primary care provider, and they got him all the services he needed, and it had a, a happy ending. But that absent that accident would have been a horrible outcome. And so we're mapping this in front of this team of 30 care providers. It's a team that, um, and you can do it to the next one now, Dawn. Okay. It's a team of, um, of care providers that have never recognized the importance of the clerk. So the clerk is really part of the care team in the VA. But they're given very low status. They're not giving any customer service training. They, they weren't engaged as a meaningful part of the team. They were seen as kind of the admin piece um, and the one that kind of kept the numbers in certain places like the you know, scheduling them so that they didn't have more than two-day wait, that kind of thing. But they never were seen as part of that relationship. And we looked out after telling the story, and there were actually people in tears listening to this vet tell his story. And clerks standing there going, I had absolutely no idea what an impact I had on this patient or any patient. I, I didn't realize my role. And then the second part of the process, once you've, once you've been able to get help that community member get their story out, then the second part is you go back through with the team and the QI coach facilitates. And this community member and or patient and the team redesign that experience. If you had a magic wand, what would you change? And then that becomes their agenda for change. That becomes their goals or their improvement activities. And this is a little off of the research track, but I think there's so much overlap between quality improvement and research, especially in primary care and PBRN work. Um, that this process is something that um, really was transformative for, for our organization because we very rarely now do work with organizations that we don't include this as part of it. Because it gets you, gives the community member a voice in a way that a survey doesn't, that an interview doesn't, that a focus group doesn't. And it creates a connection between that community member and then the people kind of on the other side of the fence, right, the ones that have, are holding the power and really equalize it where the community member really becomes the storyteller and the one that's driving that agenda. Um, so I just wanted to share that as an example of probably less CBPR and more just patient partner transformation of practice. But many of these ideas and processes I think are very valuable. 
And when you're thinking about doing community-based participatory research, the goal is, is two things. One, it has to generate knowledge. It's CBPR for the sake of CBPR is to me not worth that much. It's got to add to the to what research does. It's got to add to the knowledge base. But what makes it very, very powerful is some of what Kim and, and Deepak were just sharing is when you can get the voice of the community member in there in partnership. Um, and it causes you to think about a problem in a different way. It causes you to frame your research question in a different way. It causes you to design your intervention in a different way. That's where I think the real power comes from. Um, these partnerships, and it, but you have to have very good ways that very authentically and deeply engage the community. You've got to build that kind of pathway where you're talking the same language, where they're able to share their stories in a way that the other, the researchers can receive it, or the clinicians. Next slide, Don. All right. Okay. So what happened out of this was really fascinating. One, there were leadership in the room. There was leadership in the room. And so some major changes happened just as a result of this one event. Uh, they began customer service training for all the clerks. They instituted a greeter in the parking lot that brought people into the building and then ushered them around the building. Um, another group, I said there were three different ones going on during this meeting. The gentleman had um, told the story where he was um, from the Korean War, so he was quite elderly. And he had, his whole social life was around social dancing. And he had hurt his knee, didn't have any other health problems. And because of the delay protocol at the VA for getting surgery, he had to wait six months and then another six months before he could get in for surgery. And in the course of that wait, they, they tried these minimally invasive treatments first, which all of which failed. But only then could he get on the wait list, which was another six months for surgery. So by the time he was finally able to get to that point, he was hypertensive, depressed because he'd lost his social circle because he could no longer dance. He'd gained weight because he was not getting any kind of exercise. And that one also led to a policy change after leadership heard it. And they began to change the wait times and requirements for surgery based on that story. Um, so next slide. Okay. So I guess I just want to open the floor to any questions or reactions to this. Is this something that you all could see using? Have you used anything similar? Um, before then, I move it back to Don. Kim or Deepak, have you guys used anything like this in your work? I haven't, and it, but it sounds like a great tool. I, I haven't so. as well, but it fits for some um, some work that we're doing really well, Lindy. So thanks for sharing this. Yeah, and I have a little training module we put together for the VA, so if anybody's interested in using it. But I think you can think when you're thinking about community participatory research, you think of your engagement with the community on a continuum. And there's one where you're soliciting information from the community, kind of at one end and you're listening to them and you're building it into the program. Then kind of in the middle of that continuum is where you're partnering and engaging with them directly and finding these avenues where they can tell their story in a powerful way to change agents. And then the third is where the community is actually engaging you as a service provider um, and they're running the show. And so I, I kind of think about that in each of my projects. And I don't think any area on the continuum is good or bad. It just has to align with the goals and whatever's going to drive that discovery of new knowledge the most effectively. So, all right, Don, I'm going to pass the talking stick back to you. All right, great. Thanks, Lindy. That was really great. I, I just, you know, uh, want to emphasize one thing that I heard you say, which I think is so true that, you know, this has to, this work has to be leading somewhere. It has to be generating knowledge. I think. Um, you know, one of the things where I've seen sometimes you can get off track and, you know, you do end up, you can, you can end up in a situation where folks are meeting just to be meeting and that's not, that's not what this is about. Um, and I also really like the practicality of, of uh, the method you illustrated. That's great. So I'm just going to spend uh, the last part of this talking a little bit about boot camp translation. Um, it's something that 
um, grew out of work with High Plains Research Network here in Colorado, um, led by Jack Westfall and Linda Zittleman and their Community Advisory Council. Um, and this is a lovely sunset on the way to Alamosa, Colorado, um, taken uh, this past fall as um, me and uh, one of our other uh, faculty here in Colorado, we were driving down this road and listening to uh, the Royals in the World Series. <laughs> so um, what's boot camp translation? So boot camp translation is a process um, where academic researchers, staff, and community members partner to translate evidence, medical information, jargon, clinical guidelines, into concepts, messages, and materials that are locally relevant, meaningful, and engaging to community members. It's, it's what I think of as often kind of the, the forgotten last step. Um, you know, uh, we actually had a conversation at our, uh, uh, a, a workshop at NAPCRAG where we were brainstorming a little bit with folks about what would be good things to, uh, to do boot camp translation on. And, uh, Linda, you mentioned you hadn't gotten your flu shot. That was one of the topics that came up. Let's do boot camp translation to help people understand why they should get their flu shot. You know, most of the time the messaging is just get your flu shot. It's good for you. Um, well, why? And, you know, what, what about it? Uh, so it would be a great topic. I don't think anybody's done that one yet. But that's a good example of, you know, there's this, there's this generic public health message um, but until you bring it down to the level of a local community and what's going on with them, it may be ineffective. So just to talk a little bit about the steps here. Um, so, you know, we're getting together. You learn about a topic. We spend a lot of time uh, as we're getting started. We have um, somebody come in to speak to the community, to give what we call a medical expert talk. Uh, and that's usually a pitch to the level that would be similar, that a talk would be pitched to students or residents. We, we tell our medical experts to not dumb it down, to make it you know, about an hour's worth of material that you would typically give, but expect that it's going to take about three hours to get through it because we make sure that everything gets unpacked on every slide. Um, and we tell our medical experts as we're prepping them that uh, if nobody's asked a question by the third slide, one of us facilitators will ask a question. Um, so after that evidence, after everybody's kind of on the same level playing field in terms of understanding that, then we start to think about with the community, well, what did you hear that was new? What did you hear that sounded like, oh my gosh, um, I'm going to go home and tell my family about that, or I'm going to somebody. St I see my friends tomorrow for coffee. I'm going to tell them about this. You know, we get all that stuff out on the table. Um, use lots of flip charts, um, and then okay, who needs to who needs to hear these messages? Who should be targeted? Um, what are the actions that we want people to do? And then finally, how can we create both the materials and the strategies for getting that, getting those messages out to the people that need to hear them most? Um, I'm going to use just a project that we did within uh, the Metalark uh, PBR and Consortium to kind of illustrate how this works. Um, this was an uh, ARC-funded project. Uh, L.J. Fagnan was the PI on, and um, I helped to lead. And we did use boot camp translation in this to um, help practices uh, design tools that uh, could be used for self-management support. So our aims were um, originally to implement the ARC self-management support library um, across our four, four networks. We did this in. Orpern in Oregon, Wren in Wisconsin, uh, Irene in Iowa, and Snowcap in Colorado. We used a step wedge design, um, and uh, we wanted to assess the impact of implementation on staff and patients. So we had 
some outcomes that we asked the practice staff. We asked some uh, outcomes for patients. And then qualitatively, we did some work to try to identify factors related to uh, successful implementation. And this just shows you on the map here, um, we had 16 practices and four different networks. The goal was to recruit 320 patients um, to help with our outcomes assessment. And we had over 80 clinicians and staff that were uh, involved uh, helping us to assess um, outcomes at their level. So what we did is we essentially um, did a did a with the stepped wedge as we um, the Colorado team traveled to each um, network uh, to a location where we ran a boot camp translation kickoff around this topic one day. And then we passed the baton to the local network team for them to carry on with the phone calls that happened after that first meeting. Um, and we started in Oregon, uh, in Orperin, then we went to Wisconsin, uh, then Iowa, and finally we finished up in Colorado. And we, randomi we randomly, um, Miriam, Dickinson rolled the dice and came up with that order of implementation. Uh, and then we, um, as we were, as each network was implementing, there were some uh, interviews and observations in each practice. We used a technique called qualitative comparative analysis when we were looking at that. And um, you can see we used the PAM and the PACIC for our patient outcomes, the CS PAM, and um, some questions based on uh, theory of plan behavior for our clinicians. So um, I think I've already described what's on this slide, so I'll just skip past that. Um, here's some pictures um, of work in Oregon and um, Wisconsin down here on the on the uh, lower left. Um, Matt Simpson, our fellow, posing with Herky in Iowa City. And uh, our last picture is just a, um, a final meeting we had as we were starting to analyze our data here in Colorado with um, all of our network leaders. So this slide gives you an idea of um, some of the things that uh, get put on the flip charts as we're um, getting feedback from our uh, participants. Um, there's just great stuff here. This came out of the Oregon uh, boot camp. You know, we need, um, how do we go beyond the numbers? Um, how do we em empower patients? Um, how do we hold each other accountable? Accountability came up in all of our groups. Um, trust, uh, relationships, and sometimes we use this, this um, voting mechanism with dots uh, to kind of help hone in on the messages that people think are the most important. Um, so that just gives you a little taste of uh, what this is like when we're doing it. At the end, we in, each network ended up with their own uh, tool that their practices um, started to implement to help with self-management. And you can see they, they took um, some different different forms, but uh, basically they all sort of revolved around um, setting up some sort of an action plan. Uh, but you can see the language was different in each one. We have a problem solving worksheet. We have a personal action plan. We have set it, setting a personal wellness goal. Um, and Oregon got really focused on, on diabetes. So, these are all primary care practices, and it might it, you might think, well, you know, primary care is all about the same. But you know, having having this locally influenced messaging, um, you know, they came up with what was important in their communities, which was great. Um, thank you, Miriam, for our data analysis, <laughs> and. Uh, just to show our heart, heart outcomes here um, on the patient side, we didn't see any impacts on patient activation 
We did see a uh, positive impact on process of care <coughs> um, measures where people being asked about goal setting, um, asked about uh, what they wanted to take action on, and we did see positive improvements in self-reported health. And this was over a very brief period of measurement um, of about two to two and a half months. So that was that was good to see. So um, I'm going to stop there. Let's uh, see if we have any questions while folks are looking at this wonderful picture of fly fishing on the South Platte River. Um, and uh, if I'd be interested also in hearing the stuff that you guys are working on for your concept papers, if you have ideas about how community um, participatory methods might be involved in some of that work. Okay, so we can open it up for questions now. Who would like to start? Hi, this is Mary in Cleveland. Um, I appreciated all of your um, stories and narratives. It was very interesting. Um, I was reflecting on um, the last um, example and how the sites then um, sort of use their contacts then to localize um, the or adapt the interventions to their local communities. And that although I see that as being very patient centered, I also see it as a little contradictory or to research. <laughs> In that we usually go the other way. Um, uh, and so I just wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah, wow, that's that's great. Um, so, yeah, you're right. You know, usually we think about, well, let's make this as generalizable as possible. Um, and so, here's where I think um, the rub comes in that, you know, the the science behind. Um, I might actually just go back to these tools here. Um, so we've got them. So the science behind. These, in terms of you know the um, effectiveness of having people set goals, goal setting, action planning, the science there is the generalizable piece of this. And so there's a generalizable evidence behind this, but how that actually then gets translated down to a local level is where this particular engagement methodology um, is useful. So uh, you're right. Um, you know, the fascinating thing that I didn't spend a lot of time talking about was we spent part of our initial uh, kickoff where we brought, printed off all kinds of tools and materials from the ARC um, self-management support library um, and website. And people had a chance to look at those in groups, say what they liked about them, what they didn't like. There wasn't one, one of those. We had probably 15 to 20 different exemplars uh, out of that. There wasn't one that anybody said, this is it. We can take this one and use it right off the shelf. So that, that I think illustrates um, how it's just difficult when you're working with broad-based generic um, tools and messages um, to make those fit for a particular community or setting. Mm -hmm. And maybe that brings me to another question that I've been having kind of throughout. It's the word community. Um, and so I was thinking that community could be a, like a local like community of you know, a unique subset of of a population, but can community also be defined as like um, patients with diabetes, um, or um, patients with high blood pressure? Does it? So it sounds like community could be kind of a local context of unique features of a specific unit, or it could be just like a disease group. Could you comment on that? Yeah, Lindy, do you want to take that one? Or I can. 
Go ahead, Don, and I'll okay. add in. Okay. Yeah, I, that's exactly right. Um, so uh, I think community, as, as I um, might have mentioned earlier, we think about it as, you know, sometimes it's geographical, um, but sometimes it's not. And, um, you know, we've done, we've done this work with people um, who are geographically united in community, and we've done it with people who are united in community around a particular health issue or health topic or, or um, condition like diabetes, hypertension, that sort of thing. And it, it really depends on, um, you know, how granular you want to get as well. Mm -hmm. um, like maybe who you want to generalize it to. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's exactly so that, right. So thank you for kind of clarifying that. So then, then going back to the article on the boot camp translation. So then you could look at the different, the different states, uh, like you had said, these were Oregon's tools that they had adapted. And you could look at all of the different ones and then look for commonality, right? And then come to sort of a conclusion of, hey, you know, although we did these in local sites, everybody took these AHRQ tools and, you know, reformulated them to something that was more patient-centered um, so we could get more engagement. Um, and then they all had these things in common. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay, thank you. That was very helpful. <laughs> yeah. Great, I see a, a question in the chat from Ann, Ann Gagliotti. Ann, do you want John to read that or do you want to restate it? So it's, uh, how can we build a bridge between community crafted questions, answers, and interpretation while attending to concrete outcomes? that are interpretable for policymakers and important to funders like ARC um, and thus primary care research funding which has been significantly threatened because they have a hard time pointing to clear cost and quality outcomes driven by research in PBRNs. Great question. So that's a hard, it's a hard question, Don. I mean, that's that kind of gets is. to one of the things that I've struggled a lot with because I think for a while there was there were a lot of people that piled on the bandwagon of do community research; it's good to do, and kind of lost sight of what the end game is still um, producing. You know, generalizable knowledge that will change mm -hmm. practice and improve outcomes. And I don't know, that, that's something I've actually, you know, we're working on a, a CORI grant right now that is, um, we've been funded, um, the CocoNet team, and um, we're participating in it to, to determine how communities prioritize research, research questions, how they think about research questions, how they engage with researchers. And one of the things it's gotten me thinking about is exactly this issue, because a lot of what we're getting back is, well, it builds capacity in our community organization to do this. But I'm not sure that's the goal. The goal is really generalizable knowledge that advances science, and I don't have a good answer for that yet. I know that several of the projects that I've done recently in partnership with America Bracho in particular um, have been at that level. They've had... Um, They've been able to combine kind of the deep, the things you wouldn't think of, Don, the stuff you were just raising, mm. um, that you know, just wouldn't occur to us, or, you know, the things that the community, because you're looking at it from a different side of the fence, um, brings forward. We've been able to combine that with pretty rigorous um, research methods, and we've come out with some good studies. Like, we had one that we just did um, that was a straight-up community partnership evaluating the impact of community health workers um, being integrated onto patient care teams for diabetic patients. And that was something that certainly advanced knowledge. But it combined both kind of that, and it takes somebody very kind of flexible that can bring in the qualitative knowledge of the community and recognize kind of lived experience as a form of expertise, and then can also meld that with kind of very traditional quantitative approaches to, to research. Um, 
So I guess my answer right now would be you need more of those kinds of bridge people that can, can kind of work on both sides of the equation. Yeah, yeah. An alchemist almost, which sounds too loosey-goosey for me. Right, but right. Yeah, we've um, I, where we've struggled in this area is that uh, you know, as, as you can tell, we do a lot of boot camp translation work. It's sometimes difficult to get funders, um, and particularly um, reviewers on study sections, to um, sort of be willing to take the leap with us that uh, what comes out of a boot camp translation process that we're going to actually then implement and then test the outcomes, but we don't know exactly what that's going to be. Um, that's sometimes a little difficult for them to, to, to be willing to take that leap with us. Now, where we have been able to do that, um, you know, the in-step example, um, you know, we had some, we had, you know, there, there certainly um, process and somewhat intermediate outcomes, but it was a very short study, so that was about the best we could do. Um, some of the original work with boot camp translation was done around colorectal cancer screening, and they used measures of reach in terms of um, they did random digit dialing in um, rural eastern Colorado to find out how many people had um, seen the materials that were produced. Um, as a result of the community's um, work and input, uh, they also were able to look at um, inflection uh, changes in the rates of screening for colorectal cancer. Um, we've also done kind of some similar things with um, self-management uh, or self-management of hypertension and home blood pressure reading, um, where we've been able to measure um, people actually logging in and recording their home blood pressure scores and um, positive uh, increases in that. So it's it's definitely an important thing to be thinking about. And you know, I, as I'm thinking about it, I'm not sure it's as difficult as it sounds. I think that the issue is the timing. Yeah. Because a lot of it the questions longer. that come from the community are very robust research questions that a scientist would be asking anyway. They're just much more relevant after the community kind of gets into them. Yeah. It's the timing of the results that creates the disconnect because science is a lot slower than community. There was a question about um, IRB-related issues. Can you comment on IRB-related issues? Don, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, so... I really haven't had any. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things that we're, we're pretty fortunate in that our we spent a lot of time... Um, working with our IRB to uh, sort of help them understand the work that we're doing and what the role of the community is um, as uh, basically co-researchers with us. Now, one of the challenges there is that, um, that a lot of people have run into is, you know, then do those community members go through the standard IRB training? You know, um, here we use the city city modules um, that are online, uh, which are, you know, our community members are like, no way, we're not doing that. So we worked with our IRB to, to design um, a uh, sort of half-day um, session with our community members that's based on, you know, talking about the Belmont Report, um, going through the principles of consent uh, and participation, issues around protection of of human subjects data, and um, our IRB has been willing then to, to let us use that as their training um, when we're working with community members as uh, members of the research team, and that's been that's been really helpful. We've had a similar path. So yeah. All right. Here's another question: How to determine your communities and how to find them in reality? So my response to that um, would be um, I went to a lot of meetings. Um, usually they were you know, community health meetings or they were meetings around it. I really got started in the community participatory work with the youth violence prevention. And so I would go to community meetings around um, youth violence and public health issues. 
and met people there that were very like-minded um, and interested in the same issues. And then I found a couple of organizations. I heard America Bracho actually speak at a conference. I was so impressed with her that I, I was very yeah. researcher. I actually showed up in her office with my dissertation in hand <laughs> 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 and sat in her waiting room until she'd see me. Um, and that kind of forged this very long friendship. And then I spent um, a lot of time doing what they needed. And I had a little bit, maybe I didn't have the luxury to do it now looking back because I was a junior um, faculty member, but it felt like I did at the time because I wasn't involved in a lot of funded research at that point. And so I was able to invest a lot of time in, you know, just helping them do things they needed to, which were basic evaluation studies. Um, and that's, they've been my primary community partner, and that's how it all started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, our story is similar here. You know, it's, it's really um, showing up at meetings. I think, um, you know, some of our groups have, have grown pretty organically by, you know, starting with a conversation with um, a couple of individuals that, um, have an interest in a in a certain topic, and okay, you know who should who who should be at the table? Let's let's start reaching out. Um, you have to do some cold calling, uh, and you have to be willing to do that, and um, you have to put yourself out there. But uh, it's always amazing to me how. Um, Interested and uh, you know if if you're showing good faith on your part, how much people reward that with um, their enthusiasm and uh, input and effort. It's always very humbling. One of the one of the best ways I found was to listen and solve a problem. Like mm -hmm. one of the agencies didn't have a printer, so we just went and got them a printer and brought it to them. Yeah, uh, right. And you know, very simple things that have nothing to do with research. There's one, I know we're almost out of time, Anne has made a comment. She says, I can't use the mic, but I would say that it is important to be transparent that the communities are also generating hypotheses that may or may not work, and having the community PBR and researchers and funder and policymakers all define outcomes that would be meaningful to them as far as evidence that the intervention is working. You know, I think that's a great response. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, yes. well, this, um, I, I'm afraid that uh, we're out of time. Lindy, did you have one more comment? Did you want to? No, I was just going to say, did you want to wrap it up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep, you're right on cue there. Um, this has been wonderful. I have learned a great deal, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, all of our fellows have as well, and appreciate the mentors and steering committee members who are participating and, and sharing their wisdom too. Um, so thank you, Lindy and Don. Um, really appreciate you doing this. It's been a great learning experience. Just a couple of quick housekeeping issues. Um, right now we're in the middle of our first round of check-in calls with each of you and your mentors. Um, and so we're about halfway through uh, the cohort of 17 fellows. Um, and the purposes of these are to just see how it's going so far, what your experience has been what we can improve, and then to walk through your learning plan. So if you haven't been contacted yet by Amanda Ross about scheduling that, you will be soon. And we'll try to get through all of those by about mid-January. Okay, our next webinar will be on January 21st, 2016, on research using electronic health records and big data. It will be led by Alex Christ and Laura May Baldwin. Uh, we look forward to seeing and talking with everyone then. Uh, happy holidays, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.